our, uh, the Gentiles, our other brothers and sisters, God, in, in the truths of the, of the Scripture, God. We pray your fire and power on him, God, and sustaining energy that comes from the Holy Spirit. We pray that his words come into our hearts that we can understand and that we are transformed by them. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It is so <coughs> nice to be back. Hey, it's good to have you. Good to be here. But, uh, you know, um, there's another set of Jewish holidays that are approaching. All right? And you might say, well, I'm not Jewish. Why do I need to know this? Well, it's in the Bible. All right? And what's really incredible about this holiday that we're going to be talking about today, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, we see Jesus celebrating this holiday. We see Jesus fulfilling this holiday. So you need to be aware of this. All right? Uh, and let me just give you the ground rules. All right? In Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And if you have a Bible, you can turn to it. Or you can turn on your Bible. Many people have their Bibles now on their cell phones. But in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, God gives us the ground rules. So let me just repeat the ground rules to you. Amos chapter 3, verse 7 says this. It says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So before God does anything in human history, he tells us what he's going to do. All right? Before God does anything, he tells us. It's almost as if uh, he gives us a warning. He gives us a heads up. So as we examine what's going on, we can figure out, is this from God or is this not from the Lord? All right? So Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Then in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul, he's at Berea, and he's preaching. And he's talking about all these things that Jesus was going to do. All right. Well, those in Thessalonica, they were not considered to be as worthy of what Paul was teaching. But those in Berea, they were. And this is what Paul says to them. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says, Now those were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So the people in Berea, they heard what Paul was saying, and instead of just believing it, it says that they went and they searched the scriptures. They went to see if what Paul said, if that is what was predicted. Remember, Amos chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So before God does anything, he's going to tell us what he's going to do. And those in Berea, when they heard Paul, they just didn't believe him. They checked the scriptures. This is what the government said about Pastor Bill. All right? <laughs> Pastor Bill? He may never invite me back that far. Say, myself or anybody else. Okay? If somebody comes to you and says, God says that you should do this, or that, you know what? You should be able to take that thought and go to Scripture. And if it's not there, guess what? I it's believe not. you don't have to listen to that person. Yeah. All right? When God the Holy Spirit speaks, God the Holy Spirit will not violate the Scripture. Right. Okay? They work together. How do we know it's God the Holy Spirit? Because it's in here. Right? They work together. So if someone comes to you saying something that's like, wow, where is it in the Bible? If it's not there, let it go. All right? And that's a tough one. So I want to encourage everybody to become a student of Scripture. Amen. You know? Now, let's see. My wedding ring, okay, this serves me as a reminder. This serves me as a reminder that many years ago, I made a promise to Deb to be her husband, to love her, to forsake all others, until death 
separates us. Right? Right. Well, in the same way as this wedding ring is a reminder of that, these holidays that we see in Leviticus chapter 23, these holidays, they all serve us as reminders of what God did or what he will do. All right? Some of them have been fulfilled. Some of them are yet to be fulfilled. For example, when I was here last time, we talked about what holiday? Sukkot, or tabernacles. And that's a holiday that was practiced while my people were in the wilderness and in Jerusalem. But that holiday will be fulfilled ultimately when we are in the Millennial Kingdom. That will be fulfilled sometime in the near future. Uh, the holiday that we're going to talk about today, it is called Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And what's really interesting about this holiday, this holiday gives us some incredible clues as to what Yeshua, or Jesus, was going to do for us and what he did for us. All right? So I'm going to ask you to take some notes, write some of these things down, and remember this. If you have any easy questions, I am available. Should I pass these up? Uh, I'll talk about them in a bit. Oh, okay. If you have any easy questions, I'm available. <laughs> All right? If you have any hard ones, you need to contact Pastor Biss. <laughs> All right? That, that's just the way it is. Now, I want to start off by sharing a story. And it's not my story, it's a friend's story, all right? It's my friend's story, and it's, it's very appropriate for what we're going to be talking about here. So let me just start with this story. So the name of the, the message, if we want to talk about it, it's Atonement in Bible Times and in the Synagogue Today. What happened? Question mark. Let me hope I share a story of a colleague of mine. My friend Stephen, he was about 20 years old. He was a brand new follower of Yeshua, follower of Jesus. And at the time, he found himself in Israel. G Stephen wound up in the office of a revered rabbi in the old city of Jerusalem, which was just across from the Wailing Wall. Then, as Stephen and this rabbi start talking, the rabbi has a first question. He says, do you believe in God? And Stephen, being kind of new at this, he said, you know what? Yes. That, that was fairly easy. That was kind of safe. And then we had the second question. And he says, well, what do you believe about him? Taking a very deep breath, he decided to tell him that he knew this wasn't going to go over too well that he believed Jesus is the promised Messiah. So far, things were going okay. As you can imagine, it led to a very intense conversation, sitting face to face, close enough that the rabbi wasn't stroking his beard, he was stroking Stephen's beard, all right? So that just shows you how close they were. The rabbi was grabbing Stephen's beard, all right? Almost as if he was calling Stephen, come back to Judaism. Nice. They discussed the deep subjects of righteousness, the law of Moses. Stephen didn't know much at that point, but what he did know was that he was a follower of Jesus. But when he said that we needed a sacrifice for sin, the rabbi exploded. The rabbi blew up on him. He said, you mean to tell me that you think God is some type of blood, thirsty being? Everything else was okay. Once he said we need a blood sacrifice, the conversation went sour. Stunned as he was, my friend Stephen, to hear this Orthodox rabbi say such a thing, sacrifices were central to the Old Testament method of finding God's forgiveness, of having our sins atoned for. What happened between then and now, which accounts for the attitude of this rabbi? Why is the Day of Atonement so different today than it was in Bible times? 
Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is probably the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. Yom Kippur invokes many memories and thoughts in the minds of Jewish people. It is an ever-present theme woven throughout scriptures. Three and a half thousand years after this institution, Yom Kippur still has a very powerful influence on the Jewish culture and the worship of the people of Israel. But an even greater importance is Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, provides the necessary backdrop for understanding the scope of Jesus the Messiah's payment for sin and the security of God's people today. The Day of Atonement is the English equivalent for Yom Kippur. For many, the Hebrew word the atonement is vague and sheds no light on the meaning of the holiday. Kippur is the Hebrew word for kephar, meaning to cover. Therefore, the word atonement simply means to cover. It was on Yom Kippur that atonement or covering was made for the previous year's sins. The atonement consisted of a blood sacrifice of an innocent animal. The Lord commanded in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, Leviticus 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement, covering for your souls. It is, it is the blood that makes atonement. Yom Kippur, Israel's sixth divinely instituted holiday, occurs in the autumn of each year. On the Hebrew calendar, it falls on the 10th day of Tishri, the seventh Hebrew month, which roughly corresponds to September or October. It is observed between two other major biblical holidays, the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, which happens on the first of, the, of Tishri, and the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, which happens on the 15th of Tishri. As a side note, let me see. Rosh Hashanah this year, it starts on 13th of September, so it starts next Sunday. And then Yom Kippur starts on the 22nd of September. Three separate passages outline the biblical observance of Yom Kippur. Instructions were given for the high priest in Leviticus chapter 16, for the people in Leviticus chapter 26 to 32, and for the sacrifices in Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 to 11. I'm going to read Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 32, and then from Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 to 11. So, so if you have a Bible, turn to Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse 26. And if you don't, write it down and go look at this stuff. Because remember, Amos chapter 3, verse 7, before God does anything, he tells us what he's going to do. Okay. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26. Don't call me. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On exactly the tenth month of the seventh, on the tenth day of the seventh month, it is a day of atonement. It shall be a holy complication for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You shall not do any work on this same day. For it is a day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. As for any person who does any work on this same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work at all. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls on the ninth of the month at evening. From evening until evening, you shall keep your Sabbaths. 
Okay, so that's Leviticus. That's the basic instructions. All right. There was to be a blood. There was to be a sacrifice. People were to humble their souls, and there was to be no work. And did you notice what happened? If anybody worked, they were to be cut off. Basically, they were to be executed. All right. So you see the seriousness of this holiday. Then, in Numbers chapter 29, in Numbers chapter 29, verses 7 to 11. And this is what it says. Then, on the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall humble yourselves. You shall all not do any work. You shall present a burnt offering to the Lord as a soothing aroma. One bull, one ram, seven male lambs, one year old, having them without defect, and their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephod for the bull, two tenths for the one ram, a tenth for each of the seven lambs, one male goat for a sin offering, besides the sin offering of atonement, and the continual burnt offering, and its grain offering and their drink offerings. So we see in Leviticus, and we see in Numbers, God is talking about these offerings that are to be made at the season, at this holiday. And the consequences of not doing it or working is basically death. All right? So this is very serious stuff. All right. Yom Kippur was the most solemn day of the year for the people of Israel. It was often referred to as the day. It was designed by the Lord as a day in which you shall afflict your souls. By definition, this we understand to mean fasting. It was a day devoted to fasting and repenting of one's sins during the year. Yom Kippur was not only the only fast in Judaism, but it was the only fast mandated by Scripture. Did you hear that? So this is the only time in Scripture when the Jewish people were called to fast. The Israelite who failed to devote himself to fasting and repentance on Yom Kippur was to be cut off from his people. Yom Kippur was also a day of prohibition against all forms of work. Those who chose to ignore the regulation would suffer what? Death. The death penalty. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 30. I think some of the traditions of Yom Kippur that my people celebrate, well, we might get just a glimpse here. All right? Caution. Okay? Yom Kippur is approaching. So what happens about an hour before the holiday starts? People stop eating and they stop drinking. All right, because to do so is means that you are uh, not going to be pleasing to God. All right. Excuse me. Sure. How about water? No. No water. You know, and it, it it really varies. There's there's different interpretations. All right. You know, some rabbis will say you know no food, no water, uh, and then some will say water is okay, and then some will say if you're pregnant. Walk, it's okay for you to eat. Or if you're less than 13 years of age, you can... So, you know, it, there's all these crazy ideas, but the scripture says we are to afflict our souls. All right? Uh, and for those who are married, there are no marital relations. So it's just like everything is to be set aside. Okay. Uh, another thing we do on Yom Kippur, all right? We don't wear comfortable shoes. We don't wear our, like, our leather shoes. Why? Because those, some rabbis have come up and then said the leather shoes will remind God of what? Of the golden calf that we were worshiping at Mount Sinai. So we wear other shoes like Crocs. Okay? Just kind of crazy, but it's just what we do. All right. And on Yom Kippur, we can't drive our cars either. 
So wherever we go, we got to walk, so we want to be in comfortable shoes. Now, this is what's really interesting. And someone shared this with me. If you go to Israel on Yom Kippur, yes. uh, you will, one thing that you will notice is the streets will be full of people walking, yes. okay? But there are absolutely no cars on the road, oh. all right? And if you're, drive, if you're in a car and you're driving it, you will be stoned, yeah. okay? Oh. I mean, I'm sorry to interject. Sure. When we were living there, uh, a man got called in, a friend of mine got called into the embassy, and it was on Yom Kippur. And they did. They, they beat the car and they, they threw stones at it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's a very serious time. So for those who get in their cars and drive on Yom Kippur, people go crazy over it because of just the, the implications of not doing any work. And if you're starting your car, you're doing work and blah, blah, blah. All right? Now, also on Yom Kippur, because it's the Day of Atonement, all right, starting on Rosh Hashanah, all right, or the Feast of Trumpets, which happens 10 days before, and then on Yom Kippur, what Jewish people believe is that the books of life and the books of death are opened up, all right? So in that 10-day period of time, that's when they have to reconcile with their enemies, with people that they're upset with, or whatever. So during that 10-day period, you see the Jewish people trying to reconcile, make right whatever conflict they had over the past year. Right. Now, this is really interesting. Okay, This is absolutely fascinating. What you see here are two Orthodox Jewish guys, and one thing that they will do on Yom Kippur is they will take a chicken right, and they will cut its throat all right, now it's bleed. There's blood flying, right? And they will twirl the chicken above their head. Why? Because what they're acknowledging on this holiday, you were to have a blood sacrifice. We remember, we, we used to bring a lamb. We used to bring an animal to the tabernacle or to the temple. We don't have a tabernacle. We don't have a temple anymore. But they're saying, hey, you know what? We need to have a blood sacrifice, so they'll cut the chicken's throat, and they'll hopefully, you know, be covered by its blood. But there's two problems. What are the two problems? The first problem is, it's the wrong type of blood. That's right. All right? It's chicken blood. Yeah. Doesn't count. All right? And number two, it's not being offered at the temple. So, or, the, or where the tabernacle was, it's not being offered at the, at the altar that God ordained. Yeah. All right? So that's the problem. All right. Let's see. Um, so there's another one. So you can just imagine what it was like. All right. Here's the prayer that the, these Jewish guys will recite. All right? It says, this is my exchange, this is my substitute, this is my expiation, this rooster shall go to its death, and I shall proceed to a good, long life and peace. Right? So they offer that chicken, hoping that that chicken is going to, or the rooster rather, that animal is going to die for its sins. It's a, it's a Jewish ritual called kapara, which is frowned upon by most of the Jewish community today. So those who are offering the chicken, they're not the normal, ordinary type Jews. It's the really religious Jewish people. As a person waves the chicken over his head, and he recites, this is my substitute, my atonement, the chicken will die, but I will live. Once slaughtered and used for this purpose, the chicken is then given to the poor now, my friends, this may sound really odd, but it makes sense as we move along. All right. We all know that Yom Kippur is called the Day of Atonement, but what does that really mean? We go to the temple, we fast, 
we pray. We're asking God to forgive our sins. But why is this one day different than any other day? The answer is to be found in several places in the Torah, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And again, this is where you have to search the scriptures. All right, in Leviticus chapter 16. So, you may want to just write these verses down. I'll read them real quickly. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2. This is what it says. Leviticus 16, verse 2. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Uh, Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. See, this is why you shall have scripture memorized. So I can just go boom, 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 boom. All right? That, that's a good reason. Exodus 30, verse 10 says this. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. He shall make atonement on it with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once a year throughout your generations. It is the most holy place. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 17 says this. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out. Then he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. And I read to you uh, from Leviticus chapter 23, and that's one more verse. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30. It says this. For it is on the day of atonement, it is on this day that atonement shall be made to cleanse you you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. All right? So what is the, the purpose of Yom Kippur? So that the person and so that the people of Israel might find cleansing from their sin. And you notice from the scriptures that I read, the high priest was to enter into the Holy of Holies. When? Once a year. Once a year on this day, all right, on Yom Kippur. This is when the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies. If he went in any other time, what would happen? It would cost him his life. Yeah. All, right? all right? So, this Day of Atonement, which only comes once a year, it is very serious. It was the one day when one man in Israel, the high priest, could enter in the most holy place in the temple, into the Holy of Holies, and offer sacrifices for himself and the people. This is the day when my people look to God and ask for forgiveness, for breaking his commandments and turning from his ways. It was a day to be cleansed and to find a new beginning. In order to understand exactly what atonement is, we, we must look to the Torah and see Moses' explanation of this concept. In the book of Exodus, we find the earliest mention of this day for making atonement. Aaron, the high priest, was to make atonement by offering the blood of the sin offering. You probably know that there was a lot of different offerings and sacrifices. Burnt offerings, peace offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings, festival offerings, wave offerings, and guilt offerings. But on this holiday, we were commanded to give a sin offering, Leviticus chapter 16. So it's important for us to understand what this was and how it worked. Let's read a few verses from Leviticus chapter 16 to get an idea of how this offering in the high priest was to make this happen. Leviticus chapter 16. This is important stuff. Let's see. Leviticus chapter 16, starting in verse 5. Verse 5 to 10. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering, one ram for a burnt offering, 
Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall make atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Have you ever heard of the scapegoat? Scapegoat? All right. Well, this is where it comes from. It comes from the holiday of Yom Kippur. All right. And there were two animals. One animal, basically, Aaron would put his hands on. He'd pray all the sin of Israel upon it. And then that animal was offered to the Lord. The second animal was the scapegoat. Again, all the sins of Israel were prayed upon that animal. And then that animal was uh, escorted into the wilderness. And it was eventually thrown over a cliff. And it was never seen again. Do you see the picture there? You'll see it in just a moment. If you want to know more about a sin offering, you shall look to Leviticus chapter 4. Because in Leviticus chapter 4, it talks about a sin and a guilt offering. Here's the first one. From Leviticus chapter 4, verse 28. All right, and we have here are these four principles. The first one is substitution. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 28. When he is made aware of his sin he committed, he must bring as an offering for the sin he committed a female goat without defect. All right? So the first thing is, this first principle is that of substitution. God's specific instructions to Moses was to teach each Israelite came to present the offering. He was to regard this animal as his personal substitute. So when the person who sinned brought the animal to the altar, all right, that person had to realize that that animal was his substitute. All right. The second principle. The second principle is identification. And this comes from Leviticus chapter 4, verse 29. He shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. The Israelite next placed his hand upon the head of the animal, confessed his sins, which were then, in a symbolic sense, transferred to the animal. The animal substitute became identified with the sins of the offerer. Did you catch that? Right? So the, so the person who sinned would bring an animal, all right, who was his substitute, and then the man, the person would identify with that animal. How? He basically put his hands on the animal's head, and now he confesses his sin. It goes upon the animal, and the animal's innocence is transferred to where? To the man. All right? Then we have the third principle, the death of the animal. The third principle is the death of the animal. The worshiper would kill the animal under the priest's supervision. God wanted the person who sinned to kill the animal so that he would be reminded that the penalty of sin is death. The Hebrew prophet Ezekiel put it so simply in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. He says, the person who sins will die. So can you imagine? That animal is your substitute, that person identifies with the animal, and then that person would cut the animal's throat. So you can just imagine that entire process, how bloody it was. But in that process, the person who's offering the animal, he starts to realize that that animal has to die because of his sins. And then we have the fourth principle, the exchange of life. 
But God, in his mercy, allowed the sinner to live by providing the substitute, the hints of the fourth principle, which is the exchange of life. When the animal died because of the sin of the offer was upon it, its life was then transferred to the offer. When the animal died, it gave up its life to the one who needed it. As the people brought their animal substitutes, as time passed, various attitudes started to develop. Most Israelites exhibited an attitude of ritualism. That is, they were merely went through the motions because this is what Moses asked them to do. Such people were more interested in practical things like making a living and caring for a family. Yet God detested their temple worship into just cold formality. Speaking through the prophet Isaiah, this is what God declared. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I have had enough of your burnt offerings. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. I cannot endure inequity in the solemn assembly because the people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. And their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. That was the attitude of many people back then. I hate to say it, I think it's the attitude of many people today. A couple of passages you may want to look up. Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 to 17. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. More specifically, and you may want to look at Isaiah chapter 29. Verses 13. And as we think about, you know, as people learn those traditions, or they sort of practice those commandments by rote, imagine, you know, uh, the person who goes to church, he confesses his sin, and then he leaves church, and he goes back doing what he was doing uh, that caused him to confess his sin. Does that make sense? It's almost as if it's like, you know, if you confess your sin, you should not be doing it anymore. You should stop it. That's amazing. All right. A, a second attitude that the people had was of disbelief. Oh, or actually, of belief, excuse me. There were many in Israel who, upon bringing their sacrifice, became aware of the, of the meaning of this substitute process. The Spirit of God moved in their hearts as they saw their sins, caused the suffering and the death of the animal. As they responded to God, they would internalize by faith those four principles of atonement. By doing so, they joined the remnant of believers present in every generation who faithfully follow the Lord. Furthermore, believers had the assurance of the forgiveness of their sins. David wrote in Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. On the day of atonement, when the scapegoat took away the sins of the nation, those who truly recognized and believed could explain hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, praise the Lord, knowing that their sins were forgiven. Amen. But in the 70, but in year 70 of this era, our people were faced with a crisis of enormous proportions. The Romans had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Sacrifices were no longer possible. Certainly the people had suddenly become perfect, no longer needing the prescribed sacrifices for sin. So what were they left with? More importantly, what are we left with? What does Judaism teach today? After the fall of the temple, there was a council of Jewish rabbis led by a very famous rabbi named Yohanan ben Zakkai, which convened to solve the crisis facing the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, life without an altar, life without a temple. They decided that prayer could take the place of sacrifice. 
As a basis for this, they quoted a verse in Hosea, which says, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. They concluded that God was more concerned for repentance and inward moral quality than outward ritual acts. Remember the conversation that my friend Stephen had with a rabbi in Jerusalem. This is where he's coming from. Based upon the words of this one rabbi, Israel abandoned atonement through the blood and sought it instead through good works. As a result, many traditions crept into the observance of Yom Kippur. Remember the story about the chicken? One may wonder why a chicken is chosen as opposed to one as pres uh, prescribed animals for Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. The Lord was very clear about the sacrifices that were made to be made in Jerusalem at the temple. After the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, it was forbidden to use any animal in a way that might mistakenly continue the sacrificial system. Yet the observer of Kalaparot recognizes the weight of God's word. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Kapro is the attempt to reconcile the need of atonement through the blood without the absence of the temple and the sacrificial system. The Bible teaches that God des desires both an inward right attitude and outward obedience to the command to offer sacrifices. This is clear from the Psalms. In Psalm 51, this is what David states. For ye do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. And then later on in, some, in the same passage, David writes, You will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings then young bulls will be offered on your altar. God has always required the right attitude as well as a substitute atonement for the forgiveness of sins. In the Bible, it was neither either or, it was always both and. Our rabbis have changed this. However, we are left to wonder, have they contradicted Moses? I can't answer for them. But what about the Jewish writers of the New Testament? Is their understanding of atonement consistent with Moses? How did they handle those four principles? Let's look at them real briefly. He is our substitute. John chapter 1, verse 29 says, The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Yeshua, or Jesus, is our substitute. Amen. We have to identify with him. He identified with our sins so that we were to receive him, he himself, for our sins in his body. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He died as a sin offering, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Messiah also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. And then, 1 John chapter 5, when we believe in his atoning sacrifice, we receive his life. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. A blood sacrifice is required by scripture and is centrally tied to the sin issue. The substitutionary death of an innocent one was required since the atonement of covering for sin was to be made only through the blood. The New Testament remains in agreement. From Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Remember what Yohanan Ben Zakai, that famous rabbi, says? 
peace the rabbi that helped reshape Judaism after the temple was destroyed. Modern Judaism has its roots in what he taught. Jewish tradition has recorded that in the last hours of his death, Rabbi Ben Zakkai kept weeping aloud. And this is what his disciples, this is what his followers said. Oh master, disciples, they, they exclaimed, oh tall pillar, light of the world, mighty hammer, why art thou weeping? He answered, I go to appear before the king of kings, the holy one, blessed be he. I have before me two roads, one to paradise, or heaven, and one to Gehenna, hell. And I do not know whether he will sentence me to Gehenna or admit me into paradise. At the end of his life, this famous rabbi was left with fear and uncertainty about his death. The new covenant is far superior to the old covenant in that it offers true forgiveness and cleansing from sin. There is no covering for sin under the new covenant. There is no need for one. The sin question was settled at Calvary. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17? Jesus said, I did not come to do away with the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill. So Jesus came to fulfill those requirements of a sin, of a guilt offering. The old covenant was a shadow of things to come. The new covenant is the substance. Under the old covenant, the payment for sin was anticipated. Under the new covenant, it is realized. Under the old covenant, man's lambs could only cover sin, but under the new covenant, the Lamb of God takes sin away. Under the old covenant, the sacrifices were provisional and reoccurring. Under the new covenant, the sacrifice through Jesus our Messiah's death is eternal and totally sufficient. My friends, year after year, the sound of the ram's horn calls Israel to repentance. But there is no atonement in Judaism today. There is no blood sacrifice, no temple, no priesthood. True forgiveness will never be found through the traditions of man, as such doing those good deeds or transferring one guilt to, a, to an, an animal who is your substitute. It can only come through the accepting the infinite sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah as the true Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who's familiar with Jews for Jesus? Is everybody familiar with Jews for Jesus? Yeah. Only the pastor? Uh, this guy's been here. What? No, he's been here before. <laughs> Jews for Jesus. Okay, well, let me just tell you a little bit about Jews for Jesus. You know, sit down and we'll be quiet. You'll notice. There should be, I have more of these. Jews for Jesus. We're a, a group of Jewish people who have come to faith in Jesus. And one thing that we do, we will go out to the streets and we proclaim the gospel of Jesus. We talk to Jews, we talk to everybody. Yes. Now tomorrow, there is a Labor Day, a Labor Day parade in Kensington, Maryland. Kensington is the home of a lot of Jewish, non-religious Jewish people. So we're going to the parade tomorrow, and we're going to be handing out these cards. You will notice this card starts off by saying, Resting on Labor Day. All right? And then it goes on the back. It says, How do you find rest on Labor Day? Some people watch the parade. Some people walk in the parade. Some people ignore the parade. Some people just fudge out and snooze during the parade. The Lord of rest, Yeshua, Jesus, said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and, will, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Want rest from your labors? 
what refreshment from your weariness, what those burdens lifted off you this Labor Day and forever, we recommend that you consider the Jewish Messiah offers to everyone who puts their trust in him. Right? So we'll be on the streets tomorrow passing these out, talking to all kinds of people. That's the first thing we do. The second thing we do at Jews for Jesus is we disciple. We meet with Jewish people and we help them understand the Jewish roots of the Christian, of the Christian faith. We want them to understand that you know, the Old Testament has a, a lot of different stories and prophecies about the Messiah who is going to come. So we try to connect the two. A man that I prayed with uh, it sounds almost two months ago. But this man that I prayed with two months ago, his name was Her. I was studying the Bible with her for about, I don't know, five, six, seven years or so. <laughs> her was down on his deathbed. All right, let me see if I can describe her real quickly. He was a, a graduate of West Point. He was a colonel in the Army. Uh, he worked on his I Love Me wall. He had a number of pictures with presidents. Herb had his PhD from Harvard. So he was a brilliant guy. Right? He lived, you know, uh, material wise, he was very successful. He had it all. There was only one thing that Herb mm -hmm. was missing he didn't have peace. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, Herb, what do you want? And he told me, he says, I want peace. Mm -hmm. you know? So guess what? We started to talk about the Prince of Peace. So after all these years of talking to him, it was right before he died. He said, hey, I want this peace. I want. I've had everything else, but nothing else matters when you're on your deathbed. As he was facing eternity, Help. it was three hours before he died. He oh. praised to receive Praise God. Amen. 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 And this is what was very cool. All right? On the hospital bed, his daughter, we had two daughters, one of his daughters, she jumps on, she's on the bed, okay, she's cuddling her dad. All right? You know what I mean? It was, it was a precious moment. She's cuddling her dad. And she says, Daddy, did you receive Jesus? And her goes, <laughs> and, that, and that was like his, you know, the, the final time oh. that he spoke to us. So that's the second thing we do. We try to help Jew, Jewish people understand yes. that Jesus is our Kippur, our covering Amen. for sin. Hallelujah. And then the third thing we do, we try to we want to help our Christian brothers and sisters understand the connections between the old and the New Testament. Because remember, before God does anything, Amos 3, verse 7, He's going to tell us what He's going to do. Yeah. All right? We know that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Can you imagine if Jesus appeared in Jerusalem and said, Hi, I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They would have no idea what He was talking about. Yeah. All right? But because we have the sacrificial system, because we had Yom Kippur, we knew that we needed a blood sacrifice for our sin. So at the right time, Jesus appears and he served appropriately. All right? So we try to tie the Old and the New Testament together so people understand that. Uh, a couple more comments. You'll notice this sheet right here, this is a study from Leviticus chapter 23. All right? And you will notice there's a chart on the inside. It has four uh, of the springtime holidays, three of the fall holidays. All right? You should take one. You should read it. You should study it. And remember this. If you have any easy questions, I'm available. If you have any hard ones, you should contact who? Uh, Pastor Bill. All right. You guys are learning. All right. And if you want to receive, we have a newsletter that we send out once a month. It's free. If you want to receive it, all you got to do is just fill out this card. We'll send it to you. And then last but not least, 
I have some materials right there. If you want like a, the Jewish calendar, I have a few right over there. Let me pray for you, all right? Lord God, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. And we want to say thank you, Lord, that we can gather in freedom to worship you, to praise you, to just to hear your spirit, to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us, to encourage us, to help us at this point in life. God, I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters. Lord God, I pray again that your Holy Spirit would just refresh them, refresh their bodies, so that as they leave this place, as they go out into this world, as they go, whether it's to school or to work or to play or wherever they go, Lord, I pray that they will go refreshed, revitalized, and that the light of Jesus will not only be shining on the inside, but through them. God, I pray that you will use each person here to be your witness, to tell other people about the hope and the freedom and the peace that is available in Messiah Jesus. Lord God, may you be honored, may you be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters in Christ, and we just give you praise. And it's in your name, Yeshua, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, hold on, I'm done. Uh, thank you, Larry. That was great. Uh, I, I just want